Tech. Good afternoon, MCI. Great weekend from everybody this past weekend. You guys did a great job with all of your activities and your contributions. So it was a really fun weekend, my first winter carnival. And it was uh, really fun to see all you guys hard to work and hard to play. Um, today, we have another Patterson Lecture speaker. And we are lucky to have Ms. Lindsay Turner. who will be sharing her experiences and her views on this year's theme of resilience. Lindsay was born and raised in Maine, who graduated from the University of Maine nursing program in 2007. She worked diligently to help fulfill her sisters, her late sister's twin sister, Sarah Robinson, by starting up Sarah's House of Maine, which is a cancer hospitality house in Holden that has served over 350 families since it opened the doors in 2014. Lindsay continues to serve as a board member on the Sarah's House of Maine and enjoys traveling throughout the state to tell Sarah's story whenever possible. Lindsay spent the majority of her nursing career working as a bedside nurse and a manager in Bangor area hospitals. She may be familiar to the local community members because she cares for the students and staff at MSAD 53 as the school nurse. Lindsay's most recent adventure has been to help with a successful revitalization of the skating rink at Pinnacle Park, where she can be found in the winter taking care of the ice. You may even see her there today. <laughs> Lindsay lives in Pittsfield, and her fiance is Kyle Holmstrom, an MCI trustee and the chief financial officer of Chimbro Corporation. I am quite proud and very excited to listen to Ms. Lindsay Turner. Please welcome her. You guys have not had a chance to go over there, and you might want to go today because after today is going to get pretty warm. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. I am Lindsay. Thank you for that warm introduction. I'm calling my uh, talk with you guys today hashtag resilient. I think that kind of speaks to everybody, um, but it's a human experience. Um, and I actually have a couple of people that I want to come and join me. So I'm going to invite Kellen Chilton and Morgan Robinson to come on up. And you guys can come on up and hang out with me for a little bit. These guys are with me because they have a story of resilience that they'll share as well. So, honestly, when I first got the call to come and speak to you guys today, at first, my first thought was, I'm honored, but I'm not sure that I'm qualified to speak on this topic. But then my very next thought was, I'm the youngest of nine children, and five of those were older brothers. I got this. <laughs> After years of being tortured by those boys and having the scars to prove it, I understand what it means to withstand a fair amount of adversity. Any of you with siblings or large families may understand what I mean by that. Hashtag resilient. So yes, here I am, and I suppose I should share with you a bit about myself and what I plan to talk about. I promise I'll try not to bore you too much. Um, my plan is to share a little bit about resilience through the stories of real-life people that have had to face incredibly difficult situations and are here to tell you about it. The theme of resilience is scattered throughout. First, a little bit about me. As you heard, I am the youngest of nine kids, as I said before, and one of them was my identical twin sister. That's right, you heard me correctly. I didn't even give the womb to myself. <laughs> I spent part of my childhood in a three-bedroom farmhouse with 11 people in it and one bathroom. Now you can probably do the math on how spacious those living quarters were. Not exactly, hashtag resilient. I grew up in a small town just down the road in Dexter. I will attempt to hide my tiger pride in this room full of huskies. Growing up, money was always tight. For as long as I can remember, it became clear to me at a very young age that college would not be in the equation unless I made a path for myself, as there was just no feasible way to pay college tuition for that many children. And my parents were very straight with me. So I marched into the guidance office at the ripe age of 13, and I asked how it was I could go to college if my parents were poor and didn't have any money. A very surprised guidance counselor in the high school looked at me, a 13-year-old eighth grader, and answered, well, you'll have to get good grades. In fact, if you finish in the top two in your class, 
it, you can actually go to any humane school in the state for free. It'll pay your tuition. So I set out to do just that. And in 2003, I graduated as the salutatorian of my high school, not just because I wanted to, but because I had to. I missed valedictorian by three tenths of a point. Clearly, I've let it go. Hashtag is <laughs> I'll be the first to admit I'm really not that smart. And after years of having to fight and scrap from everything I had, from the food on my plate to the clothes on my back, I learned that hard work will eventually pay off. And I try to apply that to everything I do in life. After high school, I was sure I was going to be a doctor. So I entered into the pre-med program, and I start, I'm going to start this journey and become a surgeon. In my first year and a half of college, I decided I didn't think that's what I wanted to do after all. Struggling with changing my major partway in, as many of you will go on to do in the not-too-distant future, I decided to try a different field within the medical realm. And I went on to study nursing at the University of Maine. Immediately, my career began at Eastern Maine Medical Center. I loved my new career. I had a great job. I just bought a beautiful home. I was the bass player in a tiny cover band. I mean, we weren't exactly booking huge gigs, but still. <laughs> life was really, really good. This was a pivotal moment in my adult life. I was living in a newfound world where everything I had known before had changed. I began to see people firsthand at the bedside. Some people suffering, some healing, and some taking their last breath while I held their hand. While I held their hand. I began to understand that I had entered into one of the most challenging fields that there is. And it was in my exposure to seeing some of the most tragic health crises happening to others that I began to understand how important being resilient really is to the human experience. Now you know a little bit about my story, and I want to share with you the experiences of others. So I've asked two people very near and dear to me to come and join us here today. Each individual, while at different stages in life, have had and continue to have their inner strength and resilience tested every single day. These two may look like any 8 and 13 year old that you may encounter, but there is a story of resilience that lives within both of them that we are going to share. First, I want to share with you a story about my dear friend, Kellen Tilton. Kellen is the seventh child in a wonderfully blended family. The decision to bring a seventh child into the family was a major one for Kellen's parents, as I'm sure any of you can imagine, that having seven or more children is not exactly an easy undertaking. If you can ask my mom, she'll tell you as well. It's not for the faint-hearted. Hashtag resilient. <laughs> Kellen was born on a very cold winter morning, surrounded by his siblings. It was a water birth, and as his mother pulled him up into her arms out of the water, her first thoughts were how much he looked like his brothers. A perfect scrunched up little face and a blending of their family. She stayed with Kellen in the water for a long time and cradled his body in her arms, stroking his face and hands. This was the last peaceful moment they would all have together. Just after leaving the water, the midwives took him to the bed while his mother was being cared for, and then both she and her husband joined them at the baby's bed. Kellen's parents both saw the concerned look between the midwives. They were doing his assessment, and he was not moving from the waist down. Something was terribly wrong. Shortly after this, Kellen and his parents were urgently flown to Boston Children's Hospital and an emergent MRI was performed. At midnight, they were brought into a small room in the NICU and told that Kellen had a mass on his spine. It was cancer, a neuroblastoma with secondary paralysis. The nurse took them aside and said they should name him soon. They named him Kellen, meaning rock in Gaelic, and Chase after his grandfather. The very next day, Kellen became, began chemotherapy. Kellen became so sick and weak during his treatments, he lost all of his hair, including his eyebrows and every eyelash. He lost part of his hearing as well because of the chemo, and he went through days of vomiting and crying without end. Kellen fought cancer for six long months, and although permanently paralyzed from the waist down, he is now cancer-free and living his best life. Hashtag resilient. forever been changed by this experience and they decided in their family they would never say the word can't but rather we can or we will find a way and here with me today to talk a little bit about what finding your way looks like is Kevin Tilton. and it paralyzed me from the waist down. 
The answer is something that happened to me. It is not who I am. I am someone who likes to do track, rock climb, ski, kayak, swim, fish, hunt, snowmobile, four wheel, and play tennis, and lots of other stuff. I love my friends and family. I like school. I do not like math. <laughs> March 8th of 2010, my identical twin was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She was 24 years old, and her fight against cancer began right away, including surgery in Boston and open awake craniotomy and chemotherapy and radiation that lasted almost a year. She was a fighter and one of the most strong and resilient people I have ever known. During her treatments in Brewer, Sarah met people traveling hundreds of miles away for treatment, some of them spending five hours in a car each day five days a week for six weeks. And she said, we need to do something. We need to give them a place to stay. And the idea was born, her idea, that we would create a place for people to go and stay while they go through treatments, a home away from home. And she worked to inspire others to join her, including her local Rotary Club, close friends and family in the entire state of Maine. Sarah's fight was inspiring. Sadly, she died before her dream could become a reality at the age of 26. She told her family, don't let go of this idea and carry the torch. So now, with the help of a friend here, because I'm technologically not inclined, I'm gonna show you a video of where that idea and where Sarah's house is at today. My wife, Sarah Robinson, uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer and started getting treatments at the uh, cancer center up the road. While she was there, she noticed that there was patients traveling from all over the state uh, to receive their treatments there. And instantly formed a bond with them and wanted them to come and stay at our house. And so this idea that she had when we need to help people that are traveling long distances snowballed into something so much bigger than, than what she ever probably knew that it would become. She noticed how hard it was on all of the travel and she decided she was going to solve that for them. And so, uh, one thing led to another, and one idea after another, and uh, here we are, we sit in what is now Sarah's house today. Sarah's house is a um, hospitality house for people. It's for people to come and stay. It's a home away from home for people with cancer that need to travel greater than 30 miles to treatment every day. And Sarah was fortunate enough to live local, but recognized the need in other people, and so it will provide for those who don't have that place to stay. What we did is, is work hard to shoehorn nine resident units in the building, uh, plus the quiet room, and an office space for us to have board meetings and uh, actually manage the facility. We had great support from the Greater Bangor area community. We had uh, a lot of contractors step up, uh, companies step up. I think people really banded together for that effort to be a volunteer on a project like this. 
is carrying through to this day. We have people with, you know, we're working here today. There's, I don't know, almost a dozen people here working, participating just to do updates on things. Well, I think one of the main things was to give people a room that they could call their own, and that also would have available for them a room which they could congregate and socialize with other people that were going through the same treatment. We have an amazing kitchen, fully stocked, everything you could imagine. So guests can come, they don't need to bring anything with them. It's a big open kitchen, living room combination, and it really is the heart of the house, just like any other home, it's, it's the heart of the home we have nine guest rooms, and um, we have both twin-size beds, two twin-size beds to accommodate two people, and then we have four queen-size rooms, and we have a king-size suite. They have their own heat pump, so they control their own heat and air conditioning. They can really customize their room to be just what they want it to be. Every room has its own private bath. There's a nice comfortable chair for them to sit and read. We have a quiet room library, which is um, a nice place for people to go if the great room is a little congested and then you go to the choir room and pick up a book and read. We have laundry facilities if people come in and they're able to go upstairs and use the washer and dryer at their convenience. It turned into a, a homey place uh, for the, which for the cancer patients I think is tremendous. It is. We're lucky to have it. It's, it's uh, you know thousands of people really came together to make this happen and uh, it's I, I don't know words can't explain what it took to make this come together. It really can. I was one of the first guest patients at Sarah's house, and it meant for my husband and I the difference between having my treatment and traveling two miles or traveling 250 miles round trip, which the expense alone was prohibitive. So it has meant everything to us in that journey. It seemed like a miracle to us to have a place to come. Uh, not to have to get in our vehicle and travel two hours to go back home. It took me about um, 10 seconds after I got here. I knew that this was a great place for me to stay. Being able to stay here through the winter because we had such a bad winter was a blessing to us. Not having to travel or find a hotel room. Uh, they welcomed us with open arms here and it was just a blessing. Right away, just staying here relieved the pressure of the travel and the worry about getting here and some of the other things. And it also relieved a little bit the pressure of going over the hospital because there was friends here. Sarah's house is uh, one of the greatest things that happened. Looking back, it's just sort of a miracle and, uh, that we're here where we are today, but it all started as an idea from Sarah. It's exciting to be able to say that we're sitting in Sarah's house and there's patients staying here tonight, so the family's staying here tonight, so it's, it's exciting. In order to ensure the long-term success of Sarah's house, we still have some money that we have to raise. We need to build our endowment, and that is, is we still have a, a just under a million dollars left to raise, so that's a lot of money. So we need to fundraise in order to make sure that people can, can continue to use this house for Sarah's house has come so far. We really have. We raised a lot of money. We've done unbelievable things, but we're not there yet. Um, we really we need to finish off, cap off this campaign, and make Sarah's house a permanent fixture in the Greater Bank area and in the state of Maine. I think the people that volunteer for Sarah's house, they receive more than they ever give. They give so much of themselves. I think all, every volunteer will tell you that. The community has really stepped up for Sarah's house and we're grateful to every single person. Uh, we hope that it won't stop because um, even though the house is up and running, looks beautiful, um, the need for financial support is still there. I saw cucumbers wrapped presents at the mall and I saw lemonade packs. My mother started this project for people that have cancer when they get their treatments and it's for people that live really far away and they can stay here. I think she'd just be happy. She'd be happy to know that um, that the promise that we all made her that we 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 uh, we completed it. So uh, that was
a big deal to her. She really wanted wanted this, and uh, she really made us promise that we'd make sure it happened. Uh, it took a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of people to make it happen. We're here and we're making it happen. So now you've heard Sarah's story and how she overcame her own tragedy and worked to better the lives of others with the time she had left. And you saw this young woman, Morgan, come on back up. And I just made the connection. She was Kellen's age when she did the video. And now, uh, she's in the video. And I've asked Morgan, who's much older, and her teeth have finally all come in, to come and share with us her experiences as well. Welcome, Morgan Robinson. Patriots fans in here, Tom Brady. <laughs> but I'm guessing that most of us weren't being used as a cage, as a cane at the age of five for one of their parents suffering from a brain tumor. But I can assume we all relate to the average teenage problems, like never being able to get out of bed the first time their alarm goes off. I've only missed the bus like four times in the last year. When I was asked by my aunt to come to NCI and give a talk on resilience, I had a hard time getting started. I talked to many different people on their thoughts of resilience, and they would always ask me for further details, like, well, it depends on who we're talking about. And I would think to myself, why would that matter? We all go through hard times in life at one point or another, and we certainly can't compare each tragedy to another. But once I asked many people, I came to a conclusion that left me that left me under the impression no one has the identical definition of resilience based on their own story. Each and every individual has their own experiences, and that is what defines them and how they see the world around them. Now, instead of going on and on about the world, the word resilience or my definition, I want to share with you a story, my story, and let you interpret the rest. The day I started kindergarten, my family and I got the news that my mother's brain tumor was inoperable. I saw my mom become very sick and change rapidly in front of me. From the, from the fun, outgoing mom who took me to Petco to look at the birdies, took me on field trips and sang and danced with me in the kitchen, to someone that I wasn't sure and who still knew it all. Now I was the one helping her for her. From getting the remote to helping her get a drink or holding the door, it was strange to see her change. Everything changed. In fact, we celebrated Christmas two months early that year, so she would be there for her favorite holiday. The last time we sang Christmas carols together was also the first time that I accidentally electrocuted myself, insisting that I plugged in the Christmas tree in pitch black. My memories are few and far between. However, I will never forget the day we took her stocking off the mantle for the last time, and Christmas was still 21 days away. But here I am. Having gone through losing a parent, I have been forced to understand that there is life after loss. I experienced my dad deploying overseas when I was two years old. He has endured the unimaginable, but he holds a very special place in my heart. He is persistent and determined. He powered through holding my hand along the entire way and instilled in me the will to be resilient. He has remarried and had two beautiful children, my siblings. And losing my mom certainly did not mean that I would not go on to know what having a mother feels like. I have a mom, and no, she didn't physically give birth to me. But every day, she reminds me that that doesn't change anything. If anything, it makes our bond stronger and more powerful. Your family isn't just who has given birth to you, who lives with you. Your family isn't limited by the law or a judge's decision. Your family are the people who are there for you when you need them most. The people who have you in the forefront of their mind with the best of intentions for your success. Your family are the people who love you and the people who you love. 
My mom and I are family, always have been, and always will be. While still cherishing and honoring my birth mom, I can love both of my moms for eternity. This is my story. A story you could remind yourself of when you feel stuck or wandering in grief. But when you feel lost, find your way. Get up, move on, trust, and love. Because there is light. There is hope. I remember these words from my mom. She said, it was in my battle with cancer that I found my true purpose for living. But it is not my place to be telling you all right from wrong, because if we handled life the same way, our world would be pretty boring. We wouldn't know how to grow stronger after something has gotten us down. We wouldn't know how to rise above to maintain that strength. But overall, we wouldn't know how to join hands with one another and unite as a family. Your family can change your life. Thank you. So are health and resilience. In fact, resilience is not just something you are, but it's something you choose to be. There are active ways that you can become more resilient in your own life and build the skills necessary to endure some of life's greatest setbacks. Anything from losing the big game, failing an exam, dealing with a serious health issue, or even the death of a loved one. So how do you build these skills? What steps do you need to take? And what do you do when things go off the rails? Are you most likely to dwell on your own misfortune or spend time feeling sorry for yourself? Or begin feeling like a victim? Maybe even look to a substance that will make you feel better in that moment. We all have a choice when we're faced with life's misfortunes. That choice will determine the way you live the rest of your life and the way you feel about your circumstances. Not a single one of us are sitting in the exact same situation as the person next to us. Everyone has their own story, their own struggle, and their own makeup. And I think it's important we all consider this when we set our minds toward becoming more resilient in our own right. Resilience, simply put, is our inner strength and our ability to overcome adversity and not allow it to take us down. So, I hope you walk away today taking the moral from the stories you've heard from Kellen and his parents and family and Sarah and Morgan and knowing that you too can overcome what life throws at you. We must face our adversity head on with strength, courage, and a mindset that if you think positively like Helen and his family, and you say, I can and I will find a way instead of I can't, rethink your definition of family like Morgan, and stay connected to those that love you. Practice gratitude and help others with the time that you have left on this earth like Sarah. If there's anything I can say as a twinless twin standing here before you, it's that life is short and don't take your health for granted. You can overcome great amounts of adversity and come out on the other side okay. Maybe not the same as you were before, just a new version of yourself shining in a new light. So last, I want to get another technology. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and share with you a quick quote. Okay. On the left, we have Kellen and his mama ski. And on the right, this is just before Kellen went into surgery. Thumbs up. This picture pretty much says it all about the attitude that he took with him into that OR. And the last picture is Morgan. Just a couple years after losing her mother, sitting on a bench as we constructed the Sarah's house garden around her. On the bench, you will notice there's a quote engraved in the granite, a Scott, a, a quote from C.C. Scott, engraved in the granite, and I thought it was a perfect way to close today. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to it. Hashtag NCI Resilience. Thank you. On behalf of the MCI students, uh, MCI family, the town, and all of us, we're honored to have you here in a gift. Thanks for all that you do. It's your inspiration for everybody. Okay, students, have yourself a good afternoon.
please let our guests leave first. If they want to leave, the rest of you have a great afternoon. Thank you, sports.